Good morning. It's Jeffrey Christian of CPM Group. It's about 11.35 on Friday, the 1st of September uh, here in New York. Uh, gold is trading around 1965. It had shot up this morning to about 1980. Uh, silver is around 2465. It had shot up uh, to about 2522 this morning. Um, there was a perception when the employment figures came out that the rise in unemployment uh, and might signal that the Fed would be less likely to increase interest rates in November or December, uh, as it has repeatedly indicated it may. Uh, as the morning progressed, people realized that the increase in unemployment and number of unemployed people represented a sharp increase in the percentage of working age Americans who were entering the workforce and looking for work again, uh, which is, I guess, more of a possible positive signal than a negative signal. So the metals prices fell back. But I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm going to talk about the basics of metals trading and banking and leasing. And I'm not going to try to be a thorough person, but um, people have asked me to explain metals leasing again. Um, and there is continues to be some confusion about the differences between depositories and FCMs and clients. Uh, and then Leif Erickson, who hides behind somebody else's names, as uh, post posited in the comment, how is it possible that J.P. Morgan always makes money year over year on silver and never any losses? So, and then he then goes on to say that's proof positive of a manipulated and controlled market. Well, it's not. Um, we'll start with this one and work our way back. First off, I don't know if JP Morgan makes money year over year in silver. I do know that they are very profitable in their commodities. And the reason, Leaf, is not because it's a manipulated market. The reason is because they're a bank and they run a hedged book. See, Gold and silver have very volatile prices, and commercial entities, whether they're a producer or a manufacturer or a jeweler or a service provider or a financial service provider that holds inventories and leases it out to all of those other companies, they don't like price volatility. They don't like their profitability being dependent upon volatile prices of precious metals. So almost universally, the smart ones hedge. They protect themselves from swings in the prices up and down, and they make money by charging a fee for their services. And I've explained this before. It's not really rocket science. Um, and that's how you make money in a market. You say, look, I'm going to protect myself from the volatility of the, 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 the cost of the service. Um, and I'm going to charge you a fee for providing the service. Now, going back to the second point, there continues to be confusion about the differences among depositories, FCMs, and clients. This comes up because you saw over the last few weeks or the last week or so, you saw a lot of people talking about J.P. Morgan moving a lot of metal from eligible stocks, silver eligible stocks, into registered stocks on the COMEX, in COMEX spot source. And if we explained it, but you know, it's interesting, the people who don't understand the explanation, some of them just don't understand the explanation. Um, some of them, especially the guys talking about it on the internet, understand completely, but they choose not to because they want to pontificate about conspiracy theories that don't hold water. And it's funny because I was thinking about it. There's a guy, a coin dealer in the Midwest, and there's another guy out in the far West uh, who runs a quote depository that I, God knows if he actually has any metal in, in it. Uh, and there are other people who from time to time will pay CPM group and come to CPM group and say, Hey, can you explain this stuff to me? And we explain it to them. And then they keep talking about this and that and the other thing that's inaccurate. And we say, hey, 
you know, we explained this to you, but you haven't incorporated the information, the education that we gave you into your commentary. And they'll say privately, that's because it's not, it doesn't support our conspiracy theories. J.P. Morgan runs a depository. In that depository is gold and silver and platinum and palladium. J.P. Morgan stores some metal there. J.P. Morgan owns metal and it holds it on an edged basis. But most of the metal that J.P. Morgan, as a bank, owns, it actually has leased out and it's not in its depository. The depository is a service like a safety deposit box or a bank vault that the bank offers. And in that depository is metal that the bank might own, but other futures commission merchants and metals dealers and coin dealers and other people store metal in that depository. And private individual investors and institutional investors will store metal in that depository. The J.P. Morgan's depository, as along with other depositories that saw a lot of metal moving in and out of registered and eligible stocks this week, as we approach the first delivery day yesterday for the September Silver Comix contract, there's a lot of metal that was moving from eligible to registered and then it registered to eligible. And that reflected some deliveries being made on the part of the companies that were paying J.P. Morgan to store their metal in a safe, secure, insured, registered depository. Those metal movements did it reflect J.P. Morgan making moving metal around. It reflected changes on their clients moving metal around. And the fact that people refuse to understand the difference between a bank offering depository services and a futures commission merchant or a broker or a trader or a dealer or a producer or an industrial user or an investor paying that depository to hold that metal for it. Well, again, some people, I guess, just don't understand that, even though we and others have tried to explain it, and you can probably go to a library or bookstore and buy a book about Finance 101. And then there are other people who clearly may or may not understand it, but don't want to talk about it that way because they want to go onto the internet and wave their arms and cry and plead and don't you realize the world's about to collapse and do yourself a favor and buy gold and silver from me uh, because you won't be able to next week, except that I probably will still have some. You know, liars. So then going into leasing. But before I go into leasing, go into this chart. These are two charts. On the left, you have non-commercial, gross, long, and short, in net silver positions on the COMEX. On the right, you have commercial. Think about it this way. When an investor wants to buy a gold or a silver coin, build a coin, they go to a store and they buy it. The store owner sells it to them. The investor doesn't say, what kind of scam is this that this guy's selling this coin? Everybody wants to buy gold and silver coins. Why is he selling? Well, he's a commercial entity. He might own gold and silver on his own, the same way I do. By the way, I'm not short silver. One guy said that I'm probably in a pretty high bracket in terms of the amount of silver I own uh, relative to others, uh, although he didn't know how much I had. He just made a guess. I'm long silver. A coin dealer is a commercial entity that stands ready to buy or sell coins. He makes his profits on a margin. If he wants to stay in business, in a business selling very volatile gold and silver, he probably is hedging his inventories. When somebody else is selling futures, 
they're doing the same thing there, commercial end. You can see here all the yellow stuff. That's the gross long position of commercials on the right and left-hand side chart. And the black line is the net position. And you can see investors, generally speaking, are long silver futures. A lot of investors don't like going short. They did go short back in 16, 17, 18, into 19, when the market fundamentals sort of dictated uh, that it was a screaming sell. But they got rid of more than half of those short positions. There still are investors who are short, uh, but there are more investors long, so that investors as a group are net long. But an investor wants to buy a future, Who's going to sell it to them? Who's taking the other side of that of that trade? It's a commercial entity, almost always. You can see from the blue stuff on the left hand side, some some investors are shorting, but most of the the investors' positions, long or short, are offset by commercial entities who are there to provide that service to investors. And they do it on a hedged basis. When the commercials on the right-hand chart go long, and you can see they've been short for silver most of the time since 1996, mirroring the long position on the, on the investor side, the non-commercial side. But when an when a commercial entity goes long in silver futures, it's an offset of a hedge. And they're taking the other side of the investors. That's what they do. Just looking at my notes, because I'm jumping around and I don't want to get too... I don't want to do a primer on this. I, I want to go there. So... Metals trade. And by the way, another fallacy that you'll hear all over the internet, something like 62% of the trades in the London over-the-counter market are spot physical trades. So when you hear these guys talking about the paper trades in London, they don't know what they're talking about. But now you do, if you understood what I just said. COMEX is much more of a price determining place for individual transaction. Doesn't necessarily determine the price of gold or silver or anything else. Our analysis over the last 40 some odd years of doing this research is that short term prices have are heavily influenced, if not determined, by futures and options trading. But longer term option uh, pricing is clearly determined by the physical market's fundamentals of supply and demand. And you can see that from our tracker. Our job primarily is coming up with estimates, honest, accurate, reliable, unbiased estimates of supply and demand in physical markets. And then we use those estimates of supply and demand in the physical market to calculate and project our prices, uh, where we think prices are going. We have a really good track record called predicting prices, especially in the medium term to long term. And it's predicated on our physical research, our physical market research. And that and related research tells us that the longer term prices, and by longer term I mean beyond three months or beyond one week, are determined by the physical market and the short-term fluctuations can be determined by futures and options and OTC trading. But commercial entities run hedged books if they're smart. Producers will sometimes not hedge because they want investors to buy their stock and there was this completely ridiculous witch hunt against producers that hedged and producers did some really bad hedges. I mean, one of the largest gold producers lost hundreds of millions of dollars by first doing a bad hedge and then 
repositioning it as a spot deferred and then buying back the spots deferred, completely ignoring the advice they got from their consultants and taking the advice that they took from the bank that was taking the other side of that market. But that was an investment bank, not a commercial bank. Not that commercial banks are uh, not without fault. Refiners, smelters, semi-fabricators, converters, fabricators, uh, fabricators of semi-manufactured goods, wholesalers, retailers, they run hedged books. The prices of gold and silver and other commodities are too volatile for them to assume that they can stay in business on the margins they make if they're not running a hedged book and protecting themselves from fluctuations in the prices of, um, of the material. So that's that. Now, leasing. All of those companies have this exposure to extremely expensive raw materials, gold and silver. Let's focus on jewelry. Jewelers, because jewelry is about 80, 90% of fabrication demand for gold and probably about a third of the demand for silver. Uh, but the, what I'm going to say is true of electronics manufacturers and all sorts of other companies that use these materials. They're extremely expensive materials and they're extremely volatile in terms of their value and price. So I'm a small fabricator. Most jewelers are privately owned, uh, and the jeweler says, I need gold and silver inventory. It's really expensive. My cost of money as a privately owned company might be 8%, but it's probably closer to 15 or 20% because I generally speaking live off my credit cards because I'm a small privately owned company with exposure to, uh, to very volatile markets. And Many people who would loan me money would say, I will loan you money, but given the nature of your business, you have to run a hedged inventory book for me to loan you money. There are banks and trading companies that will say, I can loan you money, but I'd rather, and it's more advantageous for you, if I loan you metal. So if I'm going to charge you 12% for dollars to lend you, I might charge you 3% or 5% for gold and silver to lend you. I reduce your interest rate and I free up your capital. You don't have to put fine capital and put it into working inventories. You lease the material from me. I give you the material on lease. I charge you a lease rate that is a fraction of what your dollar costs to borrow dollars it is. And as you use my metal that's in your factory and then you sell it to your customers, you call me up on a daily basis and you say, hey, I'm shipping product that has 1,000 ounces of gold in it today and maybe 10,000 ounces of silver. What are your gold and silver prices? You say, okay, the banks will, will say, the lender, regardless of who it is, will say price of gold is 1960 right now. Price of silver is $24.65. The fabricator will say, okay, I am going to buy 1,000 ounces of gold off of my lease because I'm shipping it out of my factory. It will no longer be in my control. I'm going to buy 1,000 ounces of gold and 10,000 ounces of silver off of my lease and pay you for that. And I need you to send me another thousand ounces of gold, another 10,000 ounces of silver for my working inventories. Because tomorrow I'm gonna to do the same thing, more or less. Then the fabricator turns around and he sends out invoices to his clients and he says, okay, price of gold is 1960, my fabrication charges are X percent, my shipping and handling and finance charges are Y percent. The lease that he's paid for, uh, he's paid interest on, gets very put into those fees that he charges. So he's buying in 1960, and he's selling at 1960 plus his manufacturing fees, his work fees, and his 
cost of doing this business, including lease. He's freed up capital they might not even have, right? He's removed the price volatility because he only, you know, he's, he's exposed to the price volatility in that that lease rate is based on, is, is, you know, is applied to the price of the metal. I'll get back to that in a second. But he doesn't have to worry about the fact that maybe he took an order to sell his jewelry when the price of gold was 1920 and now he's buying the gold at 1960 or that he bought the gold at 1960 and now he's selling his jewelry at 1920. He's got a perfect hedge with his lease. He only locks in the price he's buying at at the time that he's selling the same material and then tops it off. All right. Now, Going back to Leaf's comment, and going back to comments I have made for decades trying to dispel some of the stupid things that you hear about gold and silver. If the price of gold was $1,250 in the beginning, the first half of 2019, and a bank is charging 3% lease rate on $1,250, you figure out what that lease costs what the interest payments are, right? Now, the price is 1960 That is, my math serves me right, $740 more than it was four years ago. Price is more than 50% higher than it was four years ago. And that jeweler is still paying 3% for its gold. And the bank is earning 3% on 1960, not on $1,250. So the lease protects the jeweler. The lease is provided by a commercial entity that hedges itself, but the bank is making much more money at 1960 than 1250. That's why back when that big precious metals dealer who was trying, paying all kinds of people to circulate conspiracy theories was going around saying, let's bankrupt J.P. Morgan by buying silver and driving the price up. That year, J.P. Morgan had record profits on its gold and silver. Why? Because the prices of gold and silver had risen. And the higher the price, the more dollars a lender of precious metals earns at the same interest rate. All right. So you didn't bankrupt J.P. Morgan. You gave them record profit. That's leasing. I, 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 I hope that explains it because I've already gone on longer than I should have. But that's how commercial entities act. Banks do banking. You want dollars? I'll lend you dollars. You want to deposit dollars? I'll hold your dollars for you. And I'll lend them out to other people, uh, uh, keeping a reserve against withdrawals. You want precious metals? I'll lend you precious metals, or I'll sell you precious metals. You want me to hold your precious metals for you? Okay, I'll either charge you a depository fee and keep it allocated and segregated to your account, same as having a safety deposit box, or I won't charge you that, but I have the right to lend out most of it. I keep some in a reserve against withdrawals, but I have the right to lend out and earn interest on some of it, the same way I do with money, because gold and silver are financial assets like money. Hope that makes sense. I hope that explains it. Um, that's about it. Have a good weekend. Uh, take care of yourself. Take care of those people around you. Try to see if you can do something good for the world because it needs your help. Take care and we'll talk to you later in the month, by which I mean next week.